Well, good morning. I have discovered what I think is a new favorite national pastime, and it is Americans love to ignore warning labels. We love it. We want to be warned about something, and then we want to totally disregard said warning. How many of us have opened up a box of Q-tips, and it says clearly in the box, not for use in inner ear, and you're like, hello, you know, right after it. How many of us, and this is one that drives my wife the most crazy, tag in the, in the clothes says, do not dry, and you're like, in you go, don't have time, just in you go. Have you ever actually, I don't think you can legally say you have been through a breakup unless you have consumed an entire tube of raw cookie dough. I think, uh, according to some customs, you may still be actually dating that person and not even be aware because you haven't cleansed yourself with the purifying salmonella that comes from cookie dough. But we ignore that warning label right on the side. It's gone. We just, no, I'm going to eat this. We ignore warning labels like all the time. We don't think it applies to us. We're like, oh, that'll never happen to me, right? Caution, contents are hot. It's a coffee. Duh. Like, I know that. But it's still there. And we know the warning labels are there. Some people want to protect themselves, right, from any sort of lawsuit because really the favorite national pastime of Americans is litigation. But we still like to ignore, ignore the warning labels. And I think the reason is because on one hand, we want to be aware. We want to know what we're getting into. We want to know what we're getting into. It's like I want to have, go in with, with full understanding and we, we want the knowledge. But we also want the control, I don't want anybody to keep me from doing this. I want to decide for myself whether or not I can engage in this. And what you find is we transfer this to our relationship with Christ. I want to be fully aware. I want to have the security. I want to have the comfort of being with Jesus, but I want to be in control. I want to be in charge. And what you find is as we live in a society that's constantly grasping for security and comfort, you might find that the security and comfort you're looking for in Jesus, you're not actually able to enjoy because you insist on the control. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at uh, a passage in Hebrews. We're going to start in chapter 5, verse 11. And this is a complicated passage. It truly is. What we're going to do is we're going to look at it. And I want us to take first steps into the idea of a warning passage. We're going to look at it as a warning. And we need to take the warning seriously, and we'll talk about why. And then we're going to talk about how we can be encouraged, and then we're going to finally close with some assurance, okay? So we're going to take, kind of take this journey down into the pit and then come back up, hopefully, encouraged and assured. And if you're not, there's an opportunity for assurance for you today. So let's talk about the warning. Let's talk about how we need to be warned today. And what happens in this passage is it's broken up, this first part, into two sections. There's a warning, or sorry, there's an observation and then there's a warning. So let's talk about the observation first, starting in verse 11. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain. Amen. Since you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits." All right, so the observation that's being made here is that these Hebrew Christians, because of the pressure of temptation and the pressure of persecution and the thought of maybe going back to Judaism, the observation that's being made is you guys are getting sluggish. And I can tell you're getting sluggish because I want to offer you assurance. I want to offer you comfort. I want you to know that Jesus is with you through the thick and the thin, and you're going to be okay during the midst of this. But I can't do that in this letter because we have to go over again and again and again the basics of the faith. You're stuck on milk. And because you are stuck on milk, you're in danger. You're vulnerable. You're at risk. Now, the milk here, we often talk about in our circles because we, we like to use milk and meat. As milk is like, oh, milk is just the yeah, basics of the gospel, you know, like all that stuff. Meat is like predestination, and like the 2,500 views of Revelation, let's get into that. 
What's being described here, the milk, is not the gospel. It is the initiation parts of the faith. It's the things that you should understand and comprehend as somebody who enters into the faith, not the gospel. The gospel is not basic. The gospel, finding out how it works in your life, throughout your life, that is a lifelong journey. That's the real meat of following Christ. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get them to the meat. And the meat that he's trying to get them to is Jesus is your high priest. You can have assurance because you have this superior high priest, but we can't get to that because you're stuck on the basics of the faith. And like I said, this leaves you vulnerable. And the vulnerability that you have is to a thing called apostasy a thing called apostasy, walking away from the faith, leaving it behind. And this takes us to the warning in verse four. And this is the complicated part. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. All right, so this warning, like I said, is one of the more confusing parts of Scripture. We have a statement by the author that he is concerned... That these Christians, these believers, are going to fall away. They're going to stop being believers. They're professed believers, but they're going to turn back and go to Judaism. Now, there's a lot here, and there's a couple of things that I want us to, to kind of uh, address first so we can adequately understand what we're talking about. And there's two theological ideas that we usually approach this passage with that I don't think this passage uh, really addresses, not addresses, but I don't think this is what the passage is talking about. The first one is losing your salvation. So there's this fear that many believers have that you can lose your salvation. What that means is not, uh, it means like you commit enough sin or you do a certain kind of bad enough sin that you can lose your salvation. God will just take it away from you like... Like you got your keys taken away from you when you were 16 because you had a speeding ticket, right? Like you, you don't not, you're not mature enough to handle salvation. I'm taking it away from you. That's not what's being in view here. And I understand it talks about them not being able to be restored to repentance. They're crucifying Christ all over again. That sounds bad. We'll talk about it. But what is actually being talked about is a thing called apostasy. Apostasy, which is this idea of vocally and, and making a decision, I am not going to follow Jesus anymore. I'm not a Christian anymore. I don't want to be under that label. I do not believe that Jesus' death matters for me in any way other than knowing it as a historical fact. It happened, but it has no eternal value for me. That's the idea of apostasy. But on the other end of the spectrum, and this is more in our circles, in the Baptist circles, is this idea of once saved, always saved. Now, if there is a term, a phrase, that I wish we could scrub from our collective theological memories... It would be once saved, always saved. Now, here's why. Once saved, always saved sounds like a nice idea. Because what you're, what you're saying or what we're trying to say is that once somebody has a genuine faith in Jesus, once they actually come to know Christ, they will get to go to heaven. And I agree with that. The problem that we have is that it is often used as an expression to point to one specific time in a person's life where we're like, oh, Jimmy, walked the aisle when he was six, he got baptized when he was seven, and at no point in his life has he shown any fruit at all. But we retreat into this kind of idea of comfort. Well, they had this experience. So we're not talking necessarily about once saved, always saved. The way we use it is more like an expression of once you've had an experience, you're always saved. Does that make sense? So what's actually being in view here is neither nor. It is this idea of perseverance. It's this idea that when somebody is genuinely a follower of Jesus Christ, they will continue to believe. They will continue to persevere. They will continue to move forward in their faith, even if they take steps back, even if they doubt, even if they struggle, even if they consider giving up the faith, even if they walk through dark seasons of the soul, at, they will return. At some point, they will come back. They will be faithful believers. But there is no such thing as somebody who rejects Christ, doesn't want anything to do with him, 
lives their life. I don't want anything to do with the believers. I'm done. I'm out. There's no such thing as that person dying and then waking up and being like, and, 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 and you know, the, the joke always goes, right? Peter standing there being like, hey, guess what? I got good news. You walked an aisle when you were six, so you've been good to go this whole time. Like there's just no, that's not a concept in scripture. It's not a concept in our mindset. And this is what's being said here. This idea of crucifying Christ all over again, what does that mean? What it means is when someone commits apostasy, when they say that Jesus' death doesn't mean anything beyond it being a historical fact, you are doing the same thing that those who mocked Jesus did when he was crucified. They're pointing to him, they're laughing, and they're saying, if you were really the Messiah, pull yourself down from there. If you were really the Messiah, we don't believe that you're really the Messiah. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're exposing him to contempt again. You're showing again, yeah, he's not really important. He doesn't matter really at all. And so it's important for us to realize that this warning here only functions as a warning if it's written to believers. And this is where our little positions here that I was talking about get us into trouble. Because on one hand, you can look, like, you look at it and you can say, I don't have to worry about this passage. I don't have to treat this passage with any kind of seriousness because I had an experience when I was a kid. Or I don't have to treat this, experience, this passage as anything significant because I'm a good Christian. I don't do super bad things, so I'm not going to lose my salvation. And so we ignore this passage. And to ignore the warning is more lethal than to ignore the warning on cookie dough and Q-tips and all that stuff. This is a severe warning that we need to be aware that God is trying to tell us something because these people, these Hebrew Christians, and I'm going to say Hebrew professed Christians, they have seen and experienced more things than we collectively have probably experienced. They probably saw miracles. They probably saw the Holy Spirit poured out on people. They may have known Paul or Peter or John they may have known Jesus himself. And this is a warning to them. This is a warning to them. And it's because of persecution. It's because of temptation. It's because of the pressure that they're under. They've become like, uh, you know, we, we've got the camp going on. The camp is an exciting time. But inevitably, whenever there's a, a youth camp, it always seems like there's one or two kids that come back really with this emotional kind of spiritual high for Jesus. And then as the pressure of the next school year builds up, they wind up kind of falling back, falling away. And we pray that that doesn't happen. That's one of the reasons to pray, is that God would keep that as a cemented sort of thing that happens. This is what's happening to the Hebrews just on a larger scale. And so what's the warning that's being said here today? It is this. It's that apostasy is a real thing. It is a real thing. And it's a real thing that we need to be aware of. Even the most seemingly devoted follower of Jesus Christ, under the right circumstances, could be tempted to give up their faith. Could be tempted. And you might say, well, that would never be me. I'd never do that. Well, Peter thought that too. And then like, as soon as things got intense, he's like, I don't even know that guy. Never seen him in my life. He committed apostasy. He fell away. All of us, based on the circumstances that we're in now, may think, I would never be tempted to do that. But it is the height of arrogance to think that. I'll take myself, for example. I, as a, as, as a professed believer, I trust in Christ, but at the same time, nobody has ever told me to choose between my life or my faith. I think I know what I'd like to say in that situation, but I don't know what I would do for sure. Nobody has threatened my family's life or my faith, right? I've never had to, uh, the, the prospect of maybe losing my job or my faith, which is good because I work at a church. That would be very weird. And so the warning applies because you have to think apostasy is a real danger out there. Under the right circumstances, if not for God's grace, I might fall away. I might commit this awful thing. And so what's one of the things to realize, one of the things to keep this uh, uh, warning kind of present in your life is to realize that apostasy is something that we do every single day. And you're like, whoa, Travis, hold on. What? I want you to divide this idea of apostasy into two categories. One, there's capital A apostasy. And this is like the big deal where you're like, I'm out, I'm done, I don't believe anymore, I'm, I'm never coming to church again, I'm out. But then there's what I call lowercase apostasy, lowercase a apostasy. All sin comes from unbelief. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Every time we sin, we are choosing to believe a lie rather than God's truth. 
And so that's a kind of apostasy. We're saying, I don't trust you, Jesus. I don't believe what you're telling me. I don't believe that your way of doing the things is the best way. I'm going to do things my way. And so we set Jesus aside and we realize the security that I want, we want is going to come from money or it's going to come from my job or it's going to come from a relationship. And we install these idols, sometimes permanently, sometimes temporarily. And then when it seems convenient and safe again, we bring Jesus back out and we're like, yeah, Jesus, you're good. We commit lowercase apostasy. We set him aside and then bring him back because we want something that functions. We're a practical people. The reason why you ignore the warning on the Q-tips is because practically speaking, there is nothing better to clean those ears. Nobody's come up with anything better. I think there's like some sort of liquid device, which is just gross. That's why we ignore it. It's practical to ignore it. And so we practically ignore the warning here. Every single step you take in your life is either a step down the road of committing capital A apostasy or it is a step of further faith in Jesus Christ. There's no neutral ground. And when we make this decision to set aside a Christ, set Christ aside, and then to bring him back, you're getting into a pattern, into a habit that when a certain kind of pressure comes, you're gonna say, I'm gonna choose the easy way because I've been choosing the easy way this whole time. And there may come a point where you don't bring Christ back, where you don't repent, where you don't confess to him. Thus revealing, perhaps, that you never really had a relationship with him to begin with. He was only somebody that you used when it was safe. You've become a functional atheist. So that's the, the warning part. And we need to take it seriously. And, and the reason why we need to take it seriously is not just to look at our lives and, and, and so that people can be scared and, and kept in line in faith. That's not it. I don't think you're going to be encouraged or assured in the rest of the passage unless you take the warning seriously. So let's look at how we can be encouraged. Let's be encouraged. Verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The author's completely changing his tone. Now he's moving to an encouragement idea. And what he's looking at, he's looking at this church's history. And he's saying, yes, apostasy is a real thing. Yes, the pressure is high on you guys. Yes, this is a real warning. However, I can look at the fruit of your life and the fruit of your uh, collective body and seeing how you've served and you've served other people and you've served the Lord and you've honored his name. And I think that's real fruit. And so I believe that you're going to persevere. I believe you're going to make it. I believe you should be encouraged. Now, this work that they're doing is not work unto salvation, okay? This is work in response to God's grace. God has done great things. God is working. God is moving in their life, and they respond to it. When you eat an amazing piece of food, some of you are thinking about it right now, right? We're coming up on, it's 1130. It's lunchtime. Let's just go. I'll finish taco joint. We'll go there. When you eat an amazing piece of food, what is the collective natural response that just comes out of you? What is it? Mmm. Mmm. Some of you are very uncomfortable by that. That's okay. It's interesting that we also, like, when we pray, people will also be like, mmm. Yeah, it's weird that we do that with food and prayer. But you almost can't help it. That is what it's like responding to God's grace. When God works in your life, when he moves in your life, when he does something in your life, the work that we do, the, 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 the response, the love that pours out of us, that's the, mm, yeah, like, ooh, grace, yes, woo, I'm going to go love somebody. And it's not even necessarily even that conscious of a decision. It's just something that happens in your life. This is why the author is so confident. They've shown themselves to not be sluggish. They're becoming sluggish. They're wearing down, but they are really, really focused. They're not sluggish. Now, what's really interesting in verse 12, he tells them so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about Paul or Peter? No, I think he's talking about the folks in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is kind of a famous uh, verse, chapter in Hebrews called the hall of faith. And it's just this laundry list of old Testament saints. Some people that you're like, yeah, Abraham, he should be there. And then there's some people like Lot that you're like, eh, 
maybe the hall of like kind of good, uh, you know, like there's kind of that debate. There's Samson's in there. Like Samson is like angry and like a colossal rage monster for most of the book of Judges, but he's in the hall of faith. And so what you realize is there's a lot of people in the hall of faith that had to persevere. They were promised something and they had to keep going, not seeing what they were guaranteed. Abraham's a big part of that. But there's a couple of people there too, like Abel and Enoch. Enoch, God loved Enoch so much that he just like took him up into heaven. He was like, dude, you're awesome. Like, let's, you should come spend the night. And then like, they just like partied together for the rest of eternity. But, but here's what you need to know about Enoch and Abel. Abel, who's his dad? Adam. Enoch lived for 305 years with Adam still on earth. So they overlapped, which you don't realize when you're like looking at all the old numbers in the Bible. It is entirely possible that Abel and Enoch both had conversations with Adam about how stinking awesome the Garden of Eden was. Like, dad, it was like that? Like, Adam, it was like that? Like, you mean to tell me that you didn't, like, you worked, but it wasn't toilsome? You mean to tell me you didn't get in fights with Eve? You mean to tell me that it was that? You mean to tell me you didn't have to wear clothing? This burlap is very rough. This is awesome. How could you screw this up? Think about the resentment that might build up in somebody. I mean, if anybody could ever go to counseling and say, my dad is the source of all my problems, Abel literally is the only one that could say that. <laughs> the resentment that must have built up. But they persevere, and Abraham perseveres, even though he makes mistakes. Abraham uh, uh, is promised a son and decides to take things into his own hands, and he decides to have uh, sex with his uh, uh, servant to try and make that happen. We talked about Moses and Gideon, all these people that like trust the Lord, but at certain points they commit that apostasy. They turn aside for a little bit because they take things into their own hands. And the difference is, what happens is, they come back, they confess, they repent. They say, oh God, I, I, didn't, I messed up. Be encouraged, y'all. We think that being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ is smooth sailing. We think the really righteous people, the really religious people have it all going easy. They do not. The hall of, of faith, the road to the hall of faith is incredibly bumpy. There will be slumps, there will be doubts, there'll be times where you, you even maybe think you've lost your faith. But I want you to know the hall of faith, interestingly enough, also probably doubles as a hall of failures. And I don't know about the hall of faith, I'm not going to say I'm in the hall of faith, but I can tell you that my plaque has long since been carved for the hall of failures. And my guess is most of you are there with me. And that should be encouraging. Because we have a God who understands. We talked about this just a little while ago. We have a God who understands our weakness. And he's made allowances for it. He's given us grace. He's given us mercy. So when you feel like you're wavering, when you feel like you're doubting, when you feel like you're struggling, when you, when you know that you've put other things before the Lord, don't be the person who's like, well, it's fine. No. Come back to the Lord. Repent. That's how that warning is supposed to function. Don't give up. Keep going. But encouragement is nice. It is not assurance. Encouragement is nice. It is not assurance. So let's be assured today. Look at verse 13. And hang with me here because I'm pretty sure this passage is the reason why more people don't teach Sunday school. So just hang with me. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself and saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's finally getting to the meat that he so desperately wanted to get to, the assurance that they need. And the assurance is this, you have a high priest who is pleading on your behalf before God. And we can trust this because God has made a promise to Abraham. 
And he guarantees it with two unchangeable things. It's hard to see what the unchangeable things are there. It is God's promise and God makes an oath. So God can't lie, but he doubles down on the promise and he makes an oath. He's like, not only will I promise it, I will swear almost like a legal sense, like a contract. I'm going to swear that I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And what does it say that Abraham does in response? It says that he has to wait patiently for God to bring it about. And you might think, wow, that's, that's amazing. Like Abraham has such perseverance in his faith. He, he just keeps going. But I want you to think about something. What is it about Abraham that gives him that patience? What is it about Abraham that gives him that perseverance? Does Abraham have some special like faithful gene that we just don't have? Like over the years of, of reproduction, we just kind of diluted it. So we're not as faithful as the people back then. No, Abraham is convinced of one thing that we often are not convinced of. God will get done what he says he will get done. God will finish what he starts. God is unstoppable. And what he says he will do, he will do. And this is where we need to realize, going back to the idea of perseverance, this is where we trip up with perseverance. Because we think that persevering in my faith is moving forward, no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. I'm going to go to church, I'm going to go to Sunday school, I'm going to keep giving, and I'm just going to keep doing it over and over and over again to prove to the world and myself that I'm actually a believer. That is not what perseverance is. Because if any part of your salvation whether it's regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, or perseverance is dependent upon you, it is a works-based salvation and you're back drinking milk with the babies again. We've got to move on from this idea that I've got a white knucklet and this is where we need to be like Abraham. Because Abraham knew I can't do anything to bring about this promise. I am 100 years old. My wife is 90 years old. Biological science was not where it is today. But he understood that they were too old to have children. God has to do it. When it comes to persevering in our faith, when it comes to maintaining your faith, despite all pressure, despite all difficulty, despite everything in the world that tells you God is not real, the only way to persevere is if God perseveres in us. It is his perseverance, not ours. It is he who keeps going. It is he who is unstoppable. And this is where the assurance comes from. If you look to yourself for assurance, if you try to catalog all the good things that you've done in your life, and you're like, oh, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, I should be pretty assured that I'm a Christian. I've believed for so long. You will never be assured. But if you look at the cross of Christ, if you look at what Jesus has done for you, going and being willing to die, you can say, why would somebody go to such lengths to have a relationship with me just to take it away from me if I mess up. Why would he, that doesn't make any sense. He was faithful to the cross. He's going to be faithful with me if I trust him and I'm just going to stick with him. No matter what happens, I, I, even if I'm struggling, even if I'm falling apart, even if everything's being taken away from me, he's going to hold me fast. And that involves recognizing that I'm in a, maybe I'm in a comfortable place right now. Maybe I've got security right now. I don't know what I'm going to do when I lose that security, but I'm going to trust that Jesus Christ is going to hold me fast. He's going to keep me safe. Notice it says in verse 19, we have an anchor behind the curtain. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. It says my anchor holds within the veil. Our anchor is Jesus Christ. That's what holds us fast. That's what keeps us safe. There's this great scene in The Lord of the Rings, and it's one of my favorites. Uh, It's at the end of the first movie. Frodo is leaving the fellowship. He's going to go to Mordor on his own, and his friend Sam is convinced. He's like, no, like, you're not doing this. Like, so Frodo's taking a boat. Uh, uh, Sam gets into the water and tries to swim after him, but he can't swim. He starts drowning, and and Frodo yells, and he's like, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone, and Sam yells back at him, of course you are, and I'm going with you. Clearly not understanding the concept of alone. So often when we commit that lowercase apostasy, when we set Jesus aside, we tell him, I'm going my own way for a while. I'm going here alone. And what we have to understand about the perseverance of Jesus Christ is he stares you back in the face and he says, of course you are. And I'm going with you. I'm going with you. You are not ever left alone from the Savior who loves you so much. 
He comes with you because he loves you and he died for you. And so what do you do with that? You trust him. You rely on him. And whatever you're uncertain about, whether it's your salvation, whether it's your faith, whether it's the way the world is, maybe you don't know what, if you're going to be fired tomorrow. Maybe you don't know if you're going to have a marriage at the end of the week. Maybe you don't know if you're ever going to get married. Your anchor holds within the veil. You go into the uncharted waters. And even though it feels like I'm going alone, Jesus responds to you, of course you are. And I'm going with you. You are not alone. So how do we respond in faith today? You gotta trust him. Take the warning seriously. But give him your life. Whatever part of you that you're holding on to, whatever part of you that you feel insecure about, whatever part that you, maybe it's an idol that you bring out just in those times when you feel insecure, it's like a blanket for you. Like a little blankie as a kid would have. Leave that behind. Put aside the old things. Be warned, but be encouraged. But above all else, be assured. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of Jesus Christ. And if you do not have assurance today, you need to talk to somebody about it because you can have it. It is something that we were given by God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that we have the promise of assurance, the hope that we place in you. Thank you that you come with us even when we sometimes try to set you aside. Thank you that you come with us. Lord, I pray today that if anybody is struggling today with doubt and with a lack of assurance, with fear, with not believing that you're really who you say you are, or maybe believing that they're like, oh, I can't trust Jesus because he might be misleading me. I, I, I might be confused. God, I pray that in your grace, you would just pour out comfort and security on those who need it. And for maybe those today, Lord, that need to feel conviction, because maybe they aren't really believers. Maybe they're that one that, that had the once saved, always saved experience, and they're just back this Sunday as a, as a token. God, I pray that in your grace, you would help them to see their need for you and that they might have assurance as well after they come to you. God, do your work, please. We're eager to see it. In your name we pray, amen.